Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mondel. Welcome to English 314, Module 4, Lecture 2, Key Terms for 19th Century Literature. Things that you'll need during this lecture from Blackboard include the three readings that the lecture will be discussing, and you can look at the PDFs on Blackboard if you printed them and have them available in hard copy, which some people do for PDFs so that they can more easily annotate them. Uh, you'll want the hard copies. The readings to which I'm referring are John Ruskin's bio and the excerpt from his essay of Queen's Gardens. You'll also want John Stuart Mill's bio and his paragraph statement repudiating the rights of husbands, as well as Virginia Woolf's bio and professions for women. So the agenda today is, first of all, welcome back. You have done uh, the first three readings in Module 4, and I had introduced a few key terms to assist you in kind of making sense of the historical context, the literary periods uh, that these texts span, uh, some of the terminology that was being used in the 19th century or by scholars today to talk about certain uh, gender issues that were uh, that came out in the readings. This lecture is going to follow up on that previous lecture, but it's going to be really textually specific. So I'm going to look at each of the assigned readings in turn and guide you through some of the most important concepts. We're going to start with John Ruskin's bio and the excerpt from Of Queen's Gardens. If you happen to have the PDF, PDF uh, pulled up from Blackboard. Some people find it a little bit easier to uh, kind of make the lecture window small and to have the two windows side by side so that you're able to see the slides as you can scan over uh, the PDF. Or if you have it in hard copy, you can just have that in front of you. There are a couple things that I want to point out about Ruskin himself. Uh, he lived from 1819 to 1900, so we're talking about the later part of the 19th century, and he was an eminent social critic. He was highly respected. Uh, he wrote a number of essays that became very popular, very important, very influential, uh, dealing with a range of social issues, everything from from aesthetics and art and architecture to political economy. Um, so the particular collection from which Of Queen's Gardens comes um, had essays that according to uh, the Norton Anthology from which these page numbers uh, are taken, these essays were considered ideal reading matter for middle class young women and enjoyed exceptional sales for rem the remainder of the 19th century, meaning after they were published in the 1860s. And this is really important because you're getting a sense of the audience for the text that you read and also the fact that the audience was supposed to learn from Ruskin's text. They were supposed to become educated and enculturated into the gender norms that they were supposed to be following by reading this text. So it was an instructive text. It is important that middle class young women are specified in this quotation because in fact the expectations were different for working class women. And there was a brief reference to this in an earlier lecture. Uh, working class women during the 19th century were able to transgress the separation of spheres. For example, they were able to work outside the home. Uh, in Victorian Britain you certainly had, for example, factories uh, where women worked and there are a number of of, uh, very prominent labor issues that came up uh, when there were accidents, etc. in those factories. There are uh, quite a few Victorian novels that deal with working class women's lives uh, with regard to such scenarios. For middle class women and uh, upper class women, the norms of the cult of true womanhood applied, and we had talked about that in the previous lecture piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity. Uh, so we really are talking about middle class women here. So an excerpt from Ruskin's uh, essay, or, and here I haven't actually excerpted full quotations necessarily, but have included some descriptions and excerpted specific parts. So according to Ruskin, men's characteristics include being, quote, active, progressive, defensive, the doer, the creator, the discoverer, the defender. Ruskin mentions men's intellect and associates men with battle and conquest and rough work in the open world. So you can see a lot of active verbs here, a lot of things involving um, action and aggression even, 
um, battle, conquest, these are warlike terms, uh, and the rough work in the open world indicates that he's talking about the public sphere, right? We're just talking about the world of com commerce, the world of military, uh, the world of work. And we talked about a little bit that separation of spheres uh, distinction in the previous lecture. On the other hand, he's got women in the private sphere, the domestic sphere. He talks about them as having power for rule, not for battle, and intellect, not for invention or creation, but for sweet ordering, arrangement, and decision. Her great function is praise. You can kind of see here um, the sort of interior decorator model or, you know, that sort of focus, the idea that everything is internal to the home, everything is inside. And even interior decorating or designing, if we were to, th to think about that in a 21st century context, the people we know who are in those professions, they're not really restricted entirely within the home. I mean, they're helping to decorate homes, but they're still active in the world of commerce, for example, in the world of business, um, purchasing materials and negotiating in those respects. Ruskin is talking about a very, very specific world that is, that is uh, relegated to one home, the inside of one home. He's also making a number of contrasts here. For example, men are fit for battle and conquest, women are not fit for battle, etc. And women's intellect, that is mentioned, but it's mentioned in a very specific way. Ruskin builds on the separation of spheres that he establishes by delineating men's and women's duties by talking about the home in particular and what that space is supposed to be. It's supposed to be guarded at all costs from the world and public sphere. He talks about how if the public sphere is allowed to come into the domestic sphere, it's no longer a home. It's been completely ruined. And the charge of maintaining the home is given to women. Um, they are to fulfill what Ruskin calls the woman's true place and power. He says that the woman must be, quote, incapable of error, enduringly, incorruptibly good, instinctively, infallibly wise, wise not for self-development, but for self-renunciation, wise not that she may set herself above her husband, but that she may, she may never fail from his side, wise not with the narrowness of insolent and loveless pride but with the passionate gentleness of an infinitely variable because infinitely applicable modesty of service um, and that later part of the quote he's talking about how the modesty of service can be adapted to an infinite number of situations that are necessary women can serve modestly in any kind of situation that might require uh, their assistance so here you can see um, basically a, a standard of perfection. I mean, incapable of error, incorruptibly good, infallibly wise, not for oneself, uh, but, but for rena uh, renouncing oneself. You see kind of the intense pressure uh, that women were experiencing through the cult of true womanhood true womanhood. Essentially, he's calling them to be perfect. He's calling them to be um, without any error. This is an enormous amount of pressure, especially when you are um, asking young middle class women to read such a text uh, to learn what their role in society is supposed to be. And so as you can imagine, there were some problems with Ruskin's model. Um, some of those problems involved uh, women who transgressed the private sphere, transgressed the domestic sphere uh, intellectually, um, women who became involved in the world of commerce or women who became involved in literary production. They were writers and chose to write frankly about certain topics that were not considered within their purview. And Virginia Woolf actually revisits this uh, in her uh, speech, Professions for Women, which we'll talk about uh, in just a few slides. And so even though Ruskin talked about this very rigid social structure, that doesn't mean that everybody in the 19th century followed this structure. You had people who resisted it. You had people who rejected it. At the same time, uh, there were some institutions, for example, the law, uh, the church, that really tried to reinforce the kinds of distinctions that Ruskin is talking about. And we know that 
regardless of how much somebody disagrees with the separation of spheres during this period, the law is the law. So for example, a married woman falls under coverture, and we talked about coverture in the last lecture and all of the restrictions therein. So even though people disagreed and fought against this, to a certain extent, they were limited uh, by legal, uh, legal statutes and, and that sort of thing. So Ruskin's perspective is not the only perspective in the 19th century during this period, but it certainly is a dominant one uh, that is, as I said, putting a lot of pressure on young women. So we can consider the, demar uh, the implications of this stark demarcation of home and world. There were limitations to educational opportunities. So for example, there were subjects that were specifically denoted as women's subjects, such as music, embroidery, painting, uh, those sorts of pursuits were considered uh, the kind of training and education that a well-bred young wom woman, so to speak, should get. And there were a lot of people who really derided this, who really ridiculed this form of education. They ridiculed it because they felt that it was actually making women's minds smaller through a socially engineered program of teaching women to be subservient and to not take part in the broad range of intellectual life that was actually available. So as early as uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Woman, which she writes uh, uh, late in the 18th century, early 19th century, Jane Austen is writing in the early 19th century, and a number of other writers, they're actually heaping ridicule on the notion that these women's pursuits, painting, embroidery, needlework, etc., are the proper education for women and that women should not go beyond the home uh, to learn other things. And there are even novels that pillory this notion. So if you've read uh, Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, for example, um, or even Pride and Prejudice, for that matter, there's a lot of kind of poking fun at this traditional curriculum, if you will, for women uh, and trying to open up. Uh, the ideas and, and thinking of society for women to actually have the same sort of education as men. Ruskin's model and his support of the separation of spheres also is the opposite of the companionate marriage model. So you'll notice the wording in Of Queen's Gardens um, makes women really subservient to men. You definitely have a patriarchal sort of structure there, whereas someone like Mill, and we'll get a little bit more into his writing in, in a few minutes, he supported a more egalitarian model in which you had two individuals in a mutually nurturing, nurturing relationship, nurturing intellectually as well as emotionally. For Ruskin, that's not on his radar, right? He's, he's not seeing that sort of a relationship. Also, there's a deliberate and structural fostering of women who were dependent on and acted subservient to men. So if women, young women are reading this to become trained on how they should be, what it means to be a woman in their society, there's this whole you know, system of women reading texts like Ruskin's and becoming dependent on men and acting subservient to them. So you can see that the gender norms uh, definitely impacted women, not only in terms of their education, but also what ended up happening, for example, if they were to marry. John Stuart Mill is going to be a transition <laughs> here from John Ruskin. Um, as you know, if you read uh, the bio, which I, I hope you read and enjoyed, it's fascinating. Um, so John Stuart Mill lives from 1806 to 1873, excuse me, 1873. And according to the Longman, which is the anthology that uh, this excerpt is taken from, Mill advocated sexual equality, the right to divorce, universal suffrage, free speech, and proportional representation. Mill went on to become the era's leading philosopher and political theorist, an outspoken member of parliament, and Britain's most prestigious proponent of women's rights. The, Mill was a big deal. He was well known in society uh, for a number of things, not just his advocacy uh, on behalf of women and his resistance to things like coverture, etc. Um, he advocated universal suffrage, in other words, the vote for women. Um, and so gender was really part and parcel of a larger framework for Mill of thinking about um, a more egalitarian society. He had a very unconventional education. He was sort of brought up to be a child protege. Um, he was pressured at a very, very young age to, for, for example, read in Greek and Latin um, in addition to English. Uh, he, was, he was educated primarily at home and tutored primarily at home and had a very rigorous sort of curriculum from a very early age. 
He followed Jeremy Bentham's philosophy of utilitarianism, which is essentially the greatest good for the greatest number, the notion that whatever benefits the majority of society is of the highest good, um, and he's well known for uh, being a proponent of utilitarian ideals. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, after this education that he received, he had a complete breakdown in 1826 um, and started questioning everything in his life. Um, he noticed that his parents had a very dysfunctional marriage and his mother, as a result, rarely showed affection towards him and he, he sort of blamed himself for that. He had, he had a lot of issues. Um, he was actually roused and revived by romantic poetry, especially Wordsworth, Wordsworth's work, um, and that led him to a different sort of orientation to life instead of sort of becoming almost a kind of automata automaton who uh, just studied and tried to memorize facts. He moved towards a different kind of ethic. And this also helped him to develop um, ideas about uh, social justice and, and society, people other than himself, and to act towards that in his political activism. He had a career with the East India Company. Uh, he worked in India House and uh, wrote dispatches and correspondence uh, related to the, the British Empire, uh, specifically in India. Remember, India was a British colony during this period, so he did that sort of work. Um, as I said, he was a political activist. Uh, you know from the bio that when he was just 17, he was arrested for distributing information on birth control. Um, so a very uh, courageous man in terms of some of the things that he did. You know about his relationship with Harriet Taylor from the bio that you read. You know that when they fell in love, she was actually married to a man who was very ill, and it was after her husband's death that she and Mill actually married. Uh, and he credits her with much of um, his work and many of the ideas uh, that he wrote about. His key works are on liberty, the subjection of women, and autobiography. You may have read some of these, for example, in a political science course. Um, John Stuart Mill is definitely one of those authors who you want to read more than one paragraph from, uh, one of those sort of classic writers uh, that you want to be acquainted with as a, as a college-educated person. If you're interested in thinking about some of the ideals of individualism that have actually heavily influenced uh, American society and our own sort of social system, uh, you might be interested in On Liberty. The subjection of women is particularly interested if you want to look specifically at issues of gender and individualism and freedom. Um, the autobiography tells you a lot about Mill's own sort of personal trajectory. Um, so I would pick one of these up, maybe flip through this uh, at some point and acquaint yourself with the ideas of an extremely fascinating writer. Um, and as I've said, Mill was extremely influential uh, in his own time. So let's actually talk about the paragraph. And this paragraph is something I always walk the class through because, as you may have noticed, the sentences are quite long. Uh, there's a particular kind of use of the semicolon going on here, and it, it takes a while to sort of catch the thread. It does help sometimes if you read pieces of it out loud and then kind of translate them or put them in your own words as you go along. Uh, but the meaning of this paragraph is really important. So he dates this March 1851. He's about to marry Harriet Taylor. And so he wants to put on public record his feelings about the institution of marriage as it exists in Victorian society. And by exists, I'm talking about the legal framework in addition to the social framework. So Mill writes, quote, being about, if I'm so happy as to obtain her consent, to enter into the marriage relation with the only woman I have ever known with whom I would have entered into that state, so he's basically saying, all right, I'm about to, to enter into the state of marriage with Haley Taylor if she'll have me. This is pretty important in terms of the wording. Uh, he talks about her consent to the marriage, so he doesn't automatically assume, you know, that she's his, and he kind of um, elevates her choice in the matter, even in the way that he's writing about the upcoming proposal. And he's basically saying, this is the only woman I've ever known who I would actually ask to marry me. So he says, being about to do that... And the whole character of the marriage relation as constituted by law being such as both she and, Ty and she and I entirely and conscientiously disapprove for this among other reasons. So he's saying, all right, so we're, we're about to do this, but let me tell you that legally the way that marriage exists in our society, both Harriet Taylor and I completely disagree with. We think that it's completely wrong. And this is why. For this, among other reasons, that it confers upon one of the parties to the contract legal power and control over the person, property, and freedom of action of the other party, 
independent of her own wishes and will. So this is coverture. This is what we talked about in the last lecture. And this is the primary thing that he's saying that he and Harriet Taylor disapprove of, that if they get married legally, she becomes his property and everything that she owns becomes his, regardless of whether she wants that or not. So we're after the semicolon now. We've gotten to the semicolon. That's a, that's a milestone for us. So he goes on and says, I, having no means of legally divesting myself of these odious powers, as I most assuredly would if an engagement to that effect could be made legally binding on me. This is important. He's saying, look, if I could say, hey, coverture doesn't apply to me under the law, I would but it's the law. There's no way for me to divest myself of these odious powers or to say that this control that the law gives me over this woman, I relinquish that control. There's no way legally for him to do this, even though he would want to do it. So thus, because he can't do that, he says that he feels, quote, it is my duty to put on record a formal protest against the existing law of marriage insofar as conferring such powers, and a solemn promise never in any case or under cir any circumstances to use them. So here he's talking about how even though legally he could use them, he, he wants to put on record that he will not. The paragraph ends with uh, the second sentence, and in the event of marriage between Mrs. Taylor and me, I declare it to be my will and intention and the condition of the engagement between us that she retains in all respects whatever the same absolute freedom of action and freedom of disposal of herself and of all that does or may at any time belong to her as if no such marriage had taken place. So he's basically saying, you know all the stuff that happens with coverture where I'm supposed to own her and all her stuff? I'm saying, by putting this on public record, that I do not intend to take advantage of any of that, and she will be able to conduct herself as if she were an unmarried woman, uh, with herself and her own property at her own disposal, uh, and subject to her own choice. And he says, I absolutely disclaim and repudiate all pretense to have acquired any rights, whatever, by virtue of such marriage. So here you see someone who clearly disapproves not only of the separation of spheres, but also of one of the, the core practices during the mid-Victorian period that held up the separation of spheres. In other words, women were kept subservient to men in large part because of marriage, right? Because legally they lost the rights of being an independent human being. Um, and he is seriously rejecting that, even though legally he has no recourse to reject it, he can't change the law, um, he is putting this on record. This is really significant for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is, I think, I really like to pair uh, Ruskin and Mill, because you start to see that even though the Victorian period kind of has a reputation for, you know, prudishness and um, complete, you know, um, uh, discrimination and oppression in terms of gender, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's true that under the law, we had what Mill calls odious powers of coverture, powers of, of husbands over wives, but it's also true that you had a pretty healthy, active movement uh, to try to change the laws, to try to change the situation. Mill was very popular in his time. Not everyone agreed with him, but he did have a following. There were people who supported his ideas. So you can kind of see the conversation and the debate that was happening uh, during this period around these issues. The other reason that I like to pair Ruskin and Mill, and specifically to assign Mill, is because it really helps bring home the point that patriarchy and the separation of spheres and coverture did not only hurt women, it also hurt men. You would not have a man writing a paragraph like this and putting it on public record that he refuses to basically take control over another human being as if he owns that human being if that relationship were not also oppressive to him. John Stuart Mill perceived that relationship of controlling and owning another human being as, as he describes, odious, as something that would dehumanize not only Harriet, Harriet Taylor, but would dehumanize himself. Um, and so you can see that, you know, this, this sort of separation of spheres and the notion that one gender is subservient to the other in society harmed everybody, uh, not just women, even though we can see the significant harms that, that women endured as a result. 
Let's fast forward a little bit historically to Virginia Woolf. Uh, so she lived from 1882 to 1941, and you read her Professions for Women. Virginia Woolf is a fascinating figure, and we couldn't possibly have time to discuss uh, in detail all of the interesting things about her life. I've just kind of put in bullet points here some of the significant things. She had a very difficult childhood. You read about how she was sexually abused, how she dealt with innumerable deaths in her family at a young age. Uh, she joined the Bloomsbury Group, which was a group that was committed to uh, literary and artistic work that dealt frankly uh, with a sort of bluntness and honesty with different aspects of human experience, including sexuality. And you know from just a cult of true womanhood that during this period, 19th century and early 20th century also, um, sometimes there was a lot of pressure on women to avoid talking about sexuality, to avoid talking about the body, to avoid talking about desire, even to avoid talking about scientific concepts. The Bloomsbury Group really resisted that sort of thinking. Um, Virginia Woolf, by being a member of the Bloomsbury Group, was also part of a group that was open to uh, sort of non-heteronormative, non-heterosexual uh, sexual orientation. Uh, so Wolf herself was bisexual and the Bloomsbury group offered um, a safe environment for her uh, to embrace her sexual orientation and to have uh, meaningful relationships uh, with others, both men and women. Uh, Virginia Woolf did kill herself. Uh, she, she sank into a deep depression and a lot of that, as you know from the bio, had a lot to do with her fear and dread of the impending World War II uh, and the consequences for her and other people that she loved. Her writing is characterized by interiority, self-reflection, uh, exploration of personal identity and relationships. There's a lot of internal monologues or kind of self-reflection, uh, and that happens, you can see a lot in, in her novels. She also wrote reviews and essays. And her writing was acutely aware of gender-based pressures for women writers in particular. She advocated uh, literature that was, quote, androgynous in mind. This is a quote from that uh, biography section on page 2082 of the Norton Anthology. And what she meant by that is that she felt like women should be able to be free to write as they wish, that there should be um, a, a rich tradition and body of work of women's writing, but that that body of work shouldn't strictly deal with, uh, quote, women's issues, but should deal with all issues, that women's writing should be universally, universally applicable to men and women, to anybody, as opposed to only uh, being appropriate for, say, just women. So Virginia Woolf talks about, in Professions for Women, uh, the move from monotonous work, where she's merely sort of doing grunt work or desk work, to independent writing where she starts to actually write some of her own ideas. And she talks about actually earning an income from doing that. So you might remember the Persian cat that appears a few times in the essay. Um, that cat becomes symbolic of the notion that a woman can actually earn an independent income from writing about her own ideas and her own thoughts. There are a few significant quotations here on 2153. She says, I discovered that if I were going to review books, I should need to do battle with a certain phantom. And the phantom was a woman, and when I came to know her better, I called her after the heroine of a famous poem, The Angel in the House. She's talking about the Coventry Patmore uh, poem that refers to the angel in the house. It was she who used to come between me and my paper when I was writing reviews. It was she who bothered and wasted my time and so tormented me that at last I killed her. So who is the angel in the house, she says. The angel in the house was intensely sympathetic. She was immensely charming. She was utterly unselfish. She excelled in the difficult arts of family life. She sacrificed herself daily. Above all, she was pure. Wolf is talking about Ruskin's woman here, right? He's, she's talking about the angel in the house as the ideal that Ruskin put forth decades earlier of what a woman should be. And what does this, this angel whisper to the woman writer? Uh, this, this angel whispers, Virginia Woolf writes, My dear, you are a young woman. You are writing about a book that has been written by a man. Be sympathetic, be tender, flatter, deceive. Use all the arts and wiles of our sex. Never let anybody guess that you have a mind of your own. Above all, be pure. This is also consistent with what Ruskin says. Remember, Ruskin says that the highest function of, of woman is praise, um, that her intellectual abilities are not for invention or creation, but for sweet arrangement, etc. So the angel in the house really embodies that sort of Ruskin notion of a woman. 
The problem with this is Ruskin's notion of a woman, according to Wolf, is something that actually prevents women from, from producing good writing, writing that is honest, writing that is true to one's heart. And so she describes, and I won't read the entire quotation here, the fact that she has to kill the angel in the house in order to keep writing. Um, she says that she found that without having a mind of your own, without expressing what you think to be the truth about human relations, morality, and sex, you can't review even a novel. And all these questions, according to the angel of the house, cannot be dealt with freely and openly by women. They must charm, they must conciliate, they must, to put it bluntly, tell lies if they are to succeed. And so she says, you know, I couldn't do that as a writer. I had to try to get rid of the angel of the house. But she says, it is far harder to kill a phantom than a reality. And this is the thing, the angel in the house wasn't just one person who's telling Virginia Woolf what to write. The angel in the house is a social norm. So everywhere Virginia Woolf looks, every corner, every new arena, there's the angel in the house again, explaining what she can or can't write about, what she can or can't think. Um, so this is a, a really pervasive image. And she talks about, towards the end of her essay, that even though by the time she's giving this speech in the 20th century, there have been advances in gender relations where women can be doctors, lawyers, civil servants, she says there are still phantoms and obstacles looming in women's way. And this is actually something that uh, some of you who were doing your gender and career presentations for your mini paper actually talked about. You talked about how we've come so far in 2016 and that these things are still coming up. So Virginia Woolf says that when you still have the phantom, when you still have restrictions on women, even though they're allowed into the professions, even though there may not be any law preventing them from those professions, to discuss and define the phantoms. She says, is I think of great value and importance, for thus only can the labor be shared, the difficulties be solved. But besides this, it is necessary also to discuss the end and the aims for which we are fighting, for which we are doing battle with these formidable formidable obstacles. I'm sorry, formidable obstacles. So Wolf is saying here that there's a way to uh, approach these problems. There's a way to try to address the phantoms that exist. And the primary way is to talk about them, to define what they are, to work together, and to figure out what kind of change uh, one is going for. So you can see here not only an identification of the problems that limited women writers, but also some ideas for how to try to address uh, prevalent and damaging gender norms in society uh, for a variety of women, even women who are not writers. And I think that's a real call uh, still to people today in terms of thinking about uh, how to kill the angel in the house that might still exist. You can think about Virginia Woolf almost as an afterword to Ruskin and Mill in the sense that Ruskin and Mill talk about what's going on in the 19th century even after there have been considerable gains. I mean, we're talking about women's suffrage, women can vote by this point, women can enter various professions. Virginia Woolf is still talking about the angel in the house. So the, the repercussions of Ruskin's ideas and the ideas that other people, of course, other than Ruskin held, uh, reverberated even into the next century and, and perhaps even to our present day. So this was a general overview and discussion of the readings that you did. I hope that this allowed you to delve a little bit more deeply into these readings. These readings will form a very important context to understand the yellow wallpaper, despite the fact that the yellow wallpaper is in the American context, whereas we've been talking about the British context. The kinds of norms that Charlotte Perkins Gilman was resisting uh, through the new woman tradition of writing are similar uh, to the kinds of things that we talked about with these three authors. I have gone a bit over the estimated time for this lecture. I'm at 33 minutes. I think that's okay since the previous lectures ran a little bit short from their estimated time, so I think we're sort of making that up. Um, I want to encourage you, if you have any questions about anything discussed in this video, to come to my office hours, uh, either virtual or in person, and to email me if you have questions. Thank you.